in radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. The date is January 19th, 2016. Man, last week is a week you won't soon forget until uh, the following week uh, when things really get crazy. Well, the following weeks ahead and the months, it's all written. Anyway, uh, the person who writes a lot of it is with us now. You, John Rubino, how are you? Hey, Kerry. I'm, I'm great. Welcome back. You've been gone for a while. Yeah, a little, little trip to the left coast, but uh, it was good. It was worth it. And I'm going back again next week. So, hey, you know, California, it's just a great place to visit, but uh, I don't know how people live in the place. I really don't know. It's just, uh, uh, it's a crazy place, you know? It just uh, the, I, the first time ever I went into a supermarket or a, no, it was a pharmacy to buy some stuff and they charged me 10 cents for a bag. I mean, gee, I felt so good about the environment there, John. I mean, I really felt like I made a contribution. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Ridiculous. And and you probably had to drive 45 minutes on the freeway to get to the drugstore. Oh, right? I won't even talk about that. Yeah. You know? But I have to tell you that if you don't have that Waze app on your phone and you live in California, you're, you're crazy. Because I went places. Uh, I'm trying to get from like Hollywood to Woodland Hills. And normally that requires you to go on the 405 uh, freeway. That's the also called the San Diego uh, freeway, I believe. And uh, that place, that's the worst highway in the country, or certainly one of the worst. But I use, uh, I use this Waze app, W-A-Z-E. It's now owned mm -hmm. by Google. And put in my destination. It takes me through these back roads and... I'm going through uh, the Hollywood Hills. I'm on like a narrow little goat herding path at one point. And I get there without like, I went on the 405 for like two minutes towards the end, but I got there like so fast. It was, it was unbelievable. Uh, it saved me easily 45 minutes of, uh, of going to the freeway and then sitting in traffic and all of that wonderful stuff. So yeah. yeah, yeah. I but but I hear the people who live on those formerly secret yeah. shortcut roads are not happy anymore because now they're on, you know, little mini freeways because yeah. everybody knows about their oh, roads. Yeah, I mean, I'm going down back roads, residential roads and and it, it's just brilliant the way that it took me there and the way that it literally shepherded me through. And then I was in uh, Simi Valley and I wanted to get back to Woodland Hills which also requires a bunch of uh, freeways to go on. And it, it literally took me right through this mountain pass that you would have never knew, known existed, John. And, and it's like I'm curving around, but then, you know, there I am. I'm in uh, Woodland Hills like two minutes later. Pretty amazing. So W-A-Z-E. pretty amazing. Yeah. And, you know, you know um, on your, your trip to LA three or four years from now, it's going to be a, an automatic self-driving car that takes you on these. Yeah. Well, I can't shortcuts. wait for that. I can't yeah. wait for it, but uh, <laughs> the sooner the better as far as I'm concerned, but we need some uh, self-driving investors here, some self-driving hedge funds, or maybe they have been all along, John. Yeah. Uh, so much of this is automated now. It's hard to tell uh, what is uh, human response to what's going on in the world and what's a black box spitting out sell orders. But whatever it was, the, this is the worst two week start to a year in history for the world's equity markets. You know, the U.S. was down hard and a lot of the, the rest of the world was down even harder. And uh, today there's a little bit of a bounce going on where U.S. stocks are up because Chinese numbers came out reasonably acceptable over the weekend. And, you know, it's funny, I, I published something with, with the headline, why are we still paying attention to Chinese numbers um, on dollar collapse with the, um, the, the point being that everybody knows China makes up their numbers. So why do their, you know, GDP reports and inflation reports have any impact on the markets? And uh, uh, I got a lot of interesting comments on it. Yeah. 
basically making the point that, whoa, there, there's a guy from America criticizing somebody else's official numbers. <laughs> and that that's actually true. You know, the, the U.S. numbers are in a lot of cases made up and everybody kind of accepts that, too. Um, so maybe I shouldn't be criticizing China, but their numbers were the ones that, that came out and affected the markets most recently. But yeah, most most official reports now are massaged one way or another. Either they use um, things like hedonic adjustment for inflation or they do seasonal adjustments for um, um, GDP and other reports. And, and, uh, and then they go back after the headline comes out and revise it in succeeding months to the real number. And usually the revisions are unfavorable for the government. Um, and those revisions get very little press because everybody pays attention to the initial headline number and that's almost it. So yeah, um, you, you have to dig deep to really get a sense of what's going on. And the sense is that things are a lot worse than they, uh, they appear. For instance, China just reported, after they reported a pretty good GDP number, they reported that their um, shipyard orders had fallen by half from a year ago <clears throat> and that their um, steel output and power consumption numbers had also fallen year over year for the first time in a really long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So a lot of these numbers that are um, being reported under the surface and not very well publicized point to an actual slowdown, not to 6.9% growth, like China's reporting as a, a top line number. Yeah, well, uh, I think it's important that you realize, regardless whose the numbers are, what government they're coming from, they're all going to be uh, massaged. They're all going to be uh, partly a work of fiction because governments don't want you to know the real story. They don't want you to, uh, to react to bad times by not spending. Uh, all of this is aimed at uh, management of perspective economics, as, as our good friend Jim Sinclair calls it, MOPE, where by getting you to believe that the economy is better than it really is, you will keep spending and therefore keep supporting it. And and then also uh, there's elections coming. So who wants who wants a negative face on things? But one thing they can't, they can't uh, lie about is how much the stock market's gone down in the U.S., how much currencies have collapsed around the world. I mean, look at the cost of living in in Canada, how much it's gone up recently, it's dramatic. And that you can't fool people with. Yeah, the, the, the Canadians have uh, seen their currency drop by uh, about 30% in the, um, the, the last year. And in one sense, that's good because it makes it easier for them to sell stuff to the rest of the world. But it's, it's also bad because they've got to import a lot of their food from the US. So food costs are spiking in Canada. And so that's really illustrating the point that the currency wars, in other words, devaluing a country's currency in order to get some kind of trade advantage, actually hurts the little guy. Because the people who spend most of their money on food are you know, working class, the working poor, uh, lower middle class. And they're the ones who are seeing inflation, while the people with a lot of assets to invest tend to benefit from a depreciating currency because they're generating um, or they're, they're making stuff that they can sell to the rest of the world. And so that's yet another kind of income redistribution plan that goes in the wrong direction. You know, it hurts the people who don't deserve to be hurt and helps the people who already have plenty. And that, that's kind of the state of the world right now in every, everywhere except the U.S. where the, the dollar is going up dramatically. Um, and um, here, the stock market, as you said, is way down, but it's actually down a lot more than the, uh, the headline number, the Dow Jones Industrials or the, the S&P 500 would indicate because um, the Russell 2000, which is um, a broad index of small cap stocks, is already in bear market territory. It's down about 22% um, in the past, really, a few weeks. And half of the stocks in the S&P 500 are down more than 20%. So we've got kind of a stealth bear market right now. You know, this is, it looks like a correction, uh, which is a drop of 10% when you just look at the, uh, the headline indexes. But it's actually a bear market for the majority of investors right now because most people don't just own Apple and Google and, and Facebook and Amazon. Most people own a broader selection of stocks. 
And um, the broader you go, the worse it looks. Yeah, that's for sure. And uh, I mean, what do you do here, John? I mean, you're kind of stuck. Uh, uh, the stock market not looking good. And uh, who knows about real estate? So uh, where would you be putting your money in this situation? Well, this this have you seen the big short? This, this yeah. right Great. now has the same feel as sort of the middle of that movie where uh, um, where credit default swaps didn't change. You know, that was the headline number from their point of view. But the housing market had already rolled over and, um, you know, mortgage defaults were spiking and everything. But the uh, the, the change in the price of the thing that they were looking at, that they were betting on, hadn't yet changed. And it eventually did. It eventually went with the rest of the market. But uh, that's kind of um, the way things are right now, where um, the underlying indicators are getting more and more negative, And the headline numbers haven't yet caught up. And uh, in, in 2008, 2009, which was the, uh, the crisis that the big short chronicles, the, the real carnage came a little later. And so it's possible that we're heading into something like that, where this is bad, but what's coming, if it plays out the way a normal financial crisis plays out, is much, much worse and a lot more chaotic. So that could be what we're looking at during the rest of 2016 if some of these trends continue to play out. You know, if oil stays really weak and we get a lot of oil-related junk bond defaults happening, which spook the credit markets, which spook the stock markets. You know, you could see something like that in a a step-by-step contagion, which ends up with a a really brutal bear market. And in that case, you know, it's hard to know what to do because you you really just want to be in all cash or be shorting this market. But this is such a manipulated system now that shorting is uh, really a professional's game. And even then, it's incredibly dangerous because you never know when the government's going to step in and say, oops, were we going to raise interest rates next month? Now nah, we take that back. We're actually going to cut interest rates. We'll give you negative interest rates for the rest of the year and we'll cut taxes and we'll you know, flood a bunch of capital into the markets again. You know, they'll, they'll do all the QE kinds of things that they did in 2008, 2009, but bigger and badder. And yeah. that could pop the stock markets. You know, the, we have kind of a Pavlovian response mm-hmm. still in the equity markets where when the Fed speaks, the traders buy. And so if you're short a market that fundamentally looks like it should be shorted, uh, you run the risk of the government interfering with your plans by messing up the normal pricing mechanism, you know, by, by spiking stocks. Uh, for no fundamental reason, just because the government is stepping in and either buying equities directly or or giving the banks a bunch of money or doing what might come next, QE for the people, where instead of creating a lot of new currency and giving it to the banks, they give it directly to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's probably the, the next stage in the experimentation process in monetary policy, where they, they do something like that, where they inject funds directly into the market. So, so or directly into individual accounts, which in theory will flow into um, the stock market and the housing market, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's the big risk from a short seller standpoint. You know, we've got a fundamentally overvalued market that should crash from here. But... You got this new factor that hasn't been there, at least on this level in the past, that you have to deal with. So, yeah, it's very hard to figure out what to do with money right now. Uh, So it could just could well be that just being in cash is the safest thing and letting the dust settle and seeing what kind of a financial system we end up with in two years and then trying to commit capital in an efficient way. But even then, who knows? this is a completely different world. Well, on that note, we got to go, but check out John's work on dollarcollapse.com. And uh, hey, check out his new podcast. I mean, tens of thousands of you already have. And go over to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. If you got time, check out our site. And John, we will talk to you next week. Thanks, Gary. Talk to you then. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.